Neon, Croy, Prince, and Jack Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. Hello, welcome to Card Table. This is uh, part two of just a pair of videos, kind of looking at looking at a structure element of the Wild Card Saga uh, and of the the triads that the saga. Uh, is broken into triads and quartets and these these narrative subsections of the overall saga and just the fact that uh, an interesting thing about these these narrative sections is that even though they're they're put under a single umbrella such as the the puppet man quartet the rocks triad the card trucks triad etc what seems to bind them together is that they have the same overarching villain or villains or just villainous some malevolent presence that sort of hovers over the, the, the books in a particular triad, but the heroes, the protagonists, actually change from one book to another. So you're not necessarily, if you were only to pick up one triad of wild cards rather than reading the whole thing, if you just were like, oh, I'll just read these four, the Rocks Quartet or whatever, you'd be potentially struck by the fact that you're not following the same heroes over all four books. So continuing to ruminate on that particular facet of the wild cards universe, we'll dive back in in 8, 9, 10, and 11, the, the Rocks Tetrad. Like some of the characters uh, in the early part, you know, kind of follow on pretty uh, intuitively. So, you know, again, Tachyon is very important in 8, 9, and 10. Lewis Shiner's character, Veronica, the prostitute who has has no last name for whatever reason. She's, uh, I guess, like Peregrine. She, she's a character with no last name. But Veronica is very important in 8 and 9. Uh, Walton Simon's character, Mr. Nobody, is very preeminent in both 8 and 9. Bloat, who isn't really a lead in Volume 8, but is, is certainly a prominent presence and then becomes a lead in Volume 9. Uh, and then again in 11. So so you think, again, you're like, okay, first two books in the triad, lots of, lots of carryover, we know who we're following. Mr. Nobody, Veronica, Tachyon and Blaze. Oh, and Captain Trips uh, is, is a prominent character both in 8 and 9 and 10. But then, uh, volume 11, which is the big climax, we get really a new set of leads. Uh, and again, they're familiar characters for the most part. But they're not really characters who that we've been following over the course of, of, the, of the Rocks jumper triad so uh it's just interesting that when we're following these characters over the course of those first books again veronica mr nobody captain trips tachyon and we sort of have got a handle on it and then along comes volume 11 dealer's choice and suddenly the the lead characters that we're following are characters that over the previous uh jumper books were not very prominent if they were there at all you know so you have characters like uh uh turtle Wayangari, who at that point hadn't been seen since all the way back in Volume 4. Uh, Modular Man is back after having been gone since Volume 5. Carnifex, who's a lead for the first time. A John Joseph Miller character that we've seen, again, going back to Volume 4, but never as a lead, or going back to Volume 3, I guess, but never as a lead character before, and now he's suddenly prom promoted to lead. So this particular arc, going from 8 through 11, which, again, common villains, but not really common heroes, uh, all, all the characters we were following, and a lot of them get relegated to the sidelines. So a character like Mr. Nobody, who was so important in the first part of the Jumper Saga, is he's in Volume 11, but he's very, very, uh, very small role in that one. Uh, Black Shadow, who's very, very significant in Volume 9, turns up in Volume 11, but pretty sidelined. I don't, I don't think Veronica features in Volume 11 at all. Tachyon doesn't feature in Volume 11 at all. So yeah, suddenly now the saga is suddenly suddenly it's about these other characters that that the that eight, nine, and ten had nothing to do with. But suddenly eleven is about Modular Man, Turtle, Wyangari, Carnifex, <laughs> and you know we still have Bloat there as a sort of you know connective tissue for sure. But it's it's sort of interesting that that the books under this one umbrella of the the jumper triad or tetrad or the rocks tetrad because the jumpers are the villains and the rocks is the the prominent sort of uh, arena of combat or, or the, ro the the con the concept of the rocks this place presided over by bloat uh, is so significant in those books but we're following different different protagonists throughout you know and again it happens again with the card sharks triad you know again i, I guess <laughs> to belabor the point i guess but similar thing happening with the card sharks triad where the um, the five characters that we follow in Black Trump, which is the big conclusion, include characters that, again, weren't necessarily particularly prominent in 13 and 14, 
but then suddenly in 15 there are leads again, which, and some of them are familiar names, Jay Aykroyd again, Carnifex again, uh, even though Aykroyd and Carnifex weren't part of the saga in 13 and 14. And then suddenly in 15, the conclusion of the Black Trump Triad, they're very important indeed. Whereas the characters who featured very prominently in the first two parts of the card chart triad, such as, you know, Bradley Finn or Joan, uh, the, the Lamia, Joan, Joan Van Rensselaer, you know, again, relegated to being supporting characters in the conclusion, if, if, if they feature at all. So it's just sort of this interesting thing about the structure of, of wildcard stories. I'm, I'm not really commenting on it as, as, as a, a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the, the way wild cards is. I mean, it works for me, obviously. I'm a big fan. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm on board with it, but it is an interesting thing to look at. Well, I, I guess here's a negative, though, just to not not to be utterly sycophantic about it, but a negative of it is that they, with the tour era, you'll see George R. R. Martin or or maybe the publisher will, will maybe say, like, this is book, book X is the start of a new cycle or a new triad. And that makes it a great jumping on point. And that can often be true, but it's interesting how, for example, with the Mean Streets triad, and I've talked before about how I think Fort Freak, which is the start of the Mean Streets triad, is indeed a great jumping on point and a great entryway into the series. And Volume 2, Low Ball, which you know, we looked at recently, features a lot of the same writers writing a lot of the same characters as in Fort Freak. A lot of the established, not just characters, but even environs of Fort Freak, you know, become become the setting as well of, of the of the storyline that, that begins in low ball but then low ball ends on a cliffhanger and then when we get to high stakes it's perhaps worth noting that Fort Freak both the location and just that milieu uh, get a little bit sidelined and uh, characters from the committee triad suddenly become prominent so that the, the characters who were, we, we became very familiar with over the course of the committee triad 18 19 and 20 the the committee kind of comes in to sort of deal with this sort of big international crisis this and I had kind of commented on how you know the the Fort Freak triad starts very much more smaller scale just back to the town of Jokertown back to back to uh, New York City Jokertown uh, the grim gritty, grim gritty grimy streets of Jokertown uh, but by the time you get to high stakes I guess as the title implies the stakes have have, have risen to the point where now it's this sort of international crisis, which means the committee has to be brought in. And so it's sort of like one of those team up you demanded moments, you know, like the committee teams up, you know, the, the, the aces of the committee team up with the, the Joker cops of Fort Freak, right? The team up you demanded. But it does mean that anyone who, you know, was, was told, oh yeah, start with Fort Freak because it's a great jumping on point. Uh, you know, they read that one, they read the next one and see, oh yeah, here's all the familiar Fort Freakers. All those all those Fort Freak cops that I got to know in the previous book, they're back. But then when you move on to high stakes, you've got a few a few returning. There's uh, exi- uh, Francis Black, or Francis Black Jr. technically, and uh, you've got uh, Marcus, aka the the Black Tongue. There, those are your two familiar touchstones from the first two books. But then it's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of committee characters are, are kind of brought in, you know, from that triad. You know, Bubbles, who's doesn't really feature much. I think she has a cameo in Fort Freak. Uh, I don't recall her being in Lowball at all, but now she's a prominent lead in High Stakes. And with her comes a lot of committee stuff, you know, a lot of, you know, Lone Grin and Jonathan Hive, Earth Witch. A lot of, a lot of those familiar committee characters uh, are sort of brought in as, as the sort of people to kind of come in and sort of save the day. And, and, and the character Tesseract, uh, A.K.A. Molly Steunenberg, who was introduced in the previous triad, and um, at, at the end of volume, or, uh, at the end of the previous triad in volume twenty, Suicide Kings, and then um, we we see a little bit more of her as a as a supporting character rather than a lead in Lowball, and then she comes to prominence as a as a lead in um, High Stakes. Barbara Baden, A.K.A. Babel, was just mentioned very briefly in a couple earlier books doesn't I don't, I don't think ever has like a really significant appearance until she's suddenly a lead in in high stakes and, and I don't know in practice whether it makes a difference you know whether I, I don't know a hypothetical reader who jumped on with Fort Freak and then kept on reading I, I don't know whether that was actually a problematic thing where they read high stakes and said hey what happened to all my familiar Fort Freak characters so that most of them are, have all been relegated to the sidelines and instead I'm reading about these characters that I apparently should be familiar with, but I'm not because I didn't read the earlier Wild Cards books. I don't know how often in practice that would really happen. 
or whether readers would care. I mean, because they would know that they were starting, you know, 23 books in, so they would know uh, to expect that kind of thing. I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I feel like I read one reader complaint where they sort of talked about how, and I'll, I'll get into the details of high stakes in the next video or, or you know, somewhere down the line, but uh, an important moment in high stakes or an important, uh, really a, a key element of the of the resolution of high stakes is something that is really is seeded way back earlier in volume 17, which is uh, titled uh, Death Draws Five. And I, I, I do remember reading one online review from someone who was getting into the Wild Cards books, but wasn't necessarily, hadn't gotten to them all yet, and was maybe reading, you know, reading them out of order and kind of trying to catch up. But they were like, yeah, all this, all this stuff at the climax, kind of, if it reads like it comes out of nowhere because it was, it's all references to stuff from uh, this Death Draws Five book, which I haven't, I don't, haven't bought yet, I haven't read yet. So, which I guess that deviates a little bit from my point about protagonists, although not, not entirely, because that the the plot point uh, to which I refer, I won't spoil it, but um, a lot of it has to do with the character Midnight Angel, who's another character who's a protagonist in High Stakes, despite the fact that she was barely in the previous parts of the, the the putative mean streets triad and so she's another character who is like suddenly very important only in the third act of, of this putative three act thing and she's the one who uh, she's the character she's written by john joseph miller and john joseph miller introduced the midnight angel in death draws five in volume 17 and so she flashes back to this earlier adventure and has this kind of epiphany moment and and realizes oh i get it i know what we need to do and it gets a little more complex than that, but <laughs> that's essentially how, how the narrative, you know, sort of goes and, and connects back to this earlier book. So, yeah, so I guess it just speaks to the question of how much of a jumping on point are these newer books in the series. Personally, I, as a, as a big fan of the, the complex continuity, I prefer it that way. <laughs> you know, that, it, that the books won't be totally self-contained, that they will sort of mine earlier continuity and you're rewarded for having read all the books leading up to this one. Commercially, I don't know how that's working out, <laughs> but I guess that's not for me to be concerned with personally, as, since I'm just a fan. But yeah, so all of that was kind of just sort of meant to be sort of a lead into an element of of uh, high stakes that I thought was interesting, just the sort of switching up the protagonists in Act 3, uh, how well that works, and, and the, the pros and cons of doing something like that. It'll probably come up again, because uh, we're going to look at do do a video on high stakes specifically, at which point um, this whole this whole element of the book will will no doubt uh, rear its head again, and so you can kind of look at it in a bit more detail, perhaps. So, but that's it for now for this particular topic. We'll get to high stakes very soon. Hope you join me. Peace out. But before we get going, may I highly recommend Cod Shocks? I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. Lately we've had some friction. Cause my baby's hooked on shared world fiction.